Read with me in Acts chapter 17, verses 16 and 17. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. The, the picture here is, is the, the, a structure built over the place that we, we read about here in Athens, the marketplace specifically, so we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But I want us to think about what's said here, what Paul did while Paul waited. We, we don't read much about Paul waiting. Usually it's Paul is here and this is what was done and here's what is said and here's the response of the people who heard what he said. Um, this is one of the rare occasions where, and we'll talk about some reasons why, Paul, Paul took a break. But then while he was taking a break, let's notice what happened. But first, just think about Paul waiting in verse 16. What, what's he waiting on? Go back in, in your chapter, back in Acts chapter 17 to verse 5. And I mean, even in verse 1, he, he comes at the beginning of this chapter to a place called Thessalonica. Uh, this is not, the Bible is not written a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away kind of thing. Uh, the Bible is written in great specificity about people and places and places you can still go visit and even some of the literal structures and sometimes even the spots where Paul and, and his enemies were. Uh, you can go walk in some of those same places today. Thessalonica is a place like that. And so he went and as he taught, in verse 5, those who were not persuaded by the things that he said, they not only didn't accept it, uh, they, they stirred up the people in that city, said it in an uproar, verse 5 says, and attacked the house of Jason where they thought uh, that Paul was going to be. And in verse 10, as a result of that, uh, the brethren sent Paul and Silas away by night. So they, they got him out of the city under the, the cover of darkness. From there, in verse 10... Uh, he's brought to Berea. And maybe you've read about the Bereans before. They were the people who searched the Scriptures daily whether the things that they heard from Paul were so. So they've gained a good reputation for that, but that wasn't everybody in the city of Berea. In verse 13, the people in that city were stirred up as well. The people in Thessalonica hated what Paul was doing so much. They left home and they, they eventually found out where he went somehow. And so they followed him to Berea, and they stirred up the crowds, and the brethren there did the same thing. They sent Paul away to go to the sea, but Silas and Timothy stayed in Berea for a short amount of, uh, of time. Don't know all the discussions and plans that were made there, uh, but this time just, just Paul was sent away. So Paul comes to, to Athens, and he could have had lots of good reasons to wait, uh, to not immediately being, begin doing the work that he typically did. Uh, Athens is a beautiful place, so kind of like Alaska. Paul, go, go, to, uh, go to Athens and just take a breather for a day and, and enjoy the sights and the sounds and the scenes. That, that, would, be, that would be okay to do. Um, maybe there were some plans that he needed to make. He's been run out of the past two cities. Maybe he needs to... Does he need to rethink his approach? Uh, I don't think that's the case. Uh, but make some plans. Or when, when Timothy and Silas come, then here's what we're going to do first and next as, as the Lord wills. Maybe Paul needed just a, a day to rest. Uh, his traveling was, was not on a, uh, in a comfortable, easy, planned manner. Uh, the first time we're told that he was sent out by night, Verse 13, it just says that he was sent away. So his sleep had probably been disrupted. So I think it would have been okay for Paul to say, I'm just going to rest today. And then when Silas comes and Timothy joins me, we'll, we'll jump right back into it. But the, his, his plan was just to wait primarily because he was waiting for Silas and Timothy to come. The, if you read the book of Acts, Paul's typical habit is to have others with him and then they go into the synagogue and in working together, they continue that work. So, plenty of good reasons uh, to wait, but we're told why he waited for, for the two who were coming. But then something interrupted that plan. His plans continue to be interrupted in one way or another. This time, though, it isn't someone else imposing their will on his that interrupts his plan. Uh, he, he interrupts himself in a way. 
We're going to read more about that. His spirit was provoked, or the NIV says that he was greatly distressed. So this time, he interrupts his own plan. He planned to wait, but, but he can't. And if, have you ever had anything like that? I'm, I'm sure, sure you have. That you had, had the plan, and maybe it was for a little bit of a break, but then something came up unexpected uh, that, that so distressed you, provoked your spirit, is the, the way the New King James translates that. But just something that so captures your mind and your attention, you, you just have to set all the plans aside, and you, you immediately have to go. Well, some, what was it that bothered Paul that much that he couldn't just wait? What I'm sh- I suppose it would have been less than a week, maybe just a couple of days. He couldn't wait for Paul and Silas to come and, and to join him and to help him. Well, that's at the end of verse, of verse 16. While he waited, his spirit was provoked with him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Somebody has, has written that in, in Athens it was easier to find an idol than a person. And whether or not that was literally true from what Paul says later in verses 22 and 23, the, the city was filled with idols and altars. And so he, he later addressed that. But, but here he, he notices that. And he notices it to a degree that says that it, he's distressed about it. It bothers him. And it bothers him to the degree then that he, he just can't wait any longer. Why, why did that bother him so much? Every place that he went to, the city was filled with lost people. And, and Paul was an educated man. He, he knew when he went into this part of the world, into Greece, he knew there would be temples. He knew there would be idols' temples. I, I'm pretty sure he knew about what they did at those idols' temples. And you, you can read about it. There was often some pretty perverse things. Even the goddesses that they wore sometimes were unclothed. And so can you imagine going to a place to worship and there's a, a fully or partially nude statue in the place that you're worshiping. That, that's surprising to us, but that wouldn't really be, have been surprising to him. He, he knew that. But something about the degree of the practice of the people in that city, he, he couldn't shake that. Uh, of course, it wasn't, wasn't his fault, so why should it bother him so much? He, he wasn't the one that directed them to do that. It wasn't that kind of a guilt. But Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, though, though I don't think at this point Paul had the book of Matthew with him, uh, maybe he had, had heard about some of the teachings of Jesus, such as uh, that wide is the gate and, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many that go in there. But narrow is the way and difficult, narrow is the gate and confined or difficult is the way that leads to life and few there are who find it. Maybe he was distressed, even though it wasn't really a new, wasn't at all a new concept to him, but he just saw the deception in that city, and he, while there would have been beautiful things to distract his, his eye and his mind, he couldn't get his eye and his mind off of the people and the destruction that they were headed to. And that, that bothered him. But why should it have bothered him so much? Because after all, in that same statement Jesus makes, most people are not going to change. The majority of the people of that city, just like the majority of the people in Berea, just like the majority of the people in Thessalonica, and just go all the way back in the book of Acts that you want to, the majority of the people who hear, they don't respond to it. They're not provoked by what they hear. They shrug their shoulders, or maybe they, they go on the offensive against it. But... Paul, Paul knew in this place he was not going to change the whole city. Every single person wasn't going to change their mind. Based on statistics, <laughs> the statistics Jesus says, in fact, most of the people of that city were not going to change their mind. In fact, very few were going to do anything. Whatever Paul did, very few people were going to react or respond to the best effort that he made. So Paul, why, why be so worked up about it? There's not much you can do, and even if you do your best, there's not much that's going to be accomplished. Uh, he, he knew that better than you and I do. Better than you and I do. Uh, but that, that didn't ease his conscience. What are you bothered by, uh, where, wherever you're from? Uh, for those of us who are here in Fairbanks, as you, as you go around, what are the things that, that you see and that are different enough 
uh, from what you know is right that you notice it. We, God sees everything. We don't see everything, but as we go about our day and our lives, there are things that we notice, and it's so different from what we know to be right that we, we see it. We see the difference. What are the things that you see, but they bother you to the degree that, that is described by, by Paul here? We can read a little bit of history. I won't take the time to do so this morning, but you could learn in, uh, with uh, some specifics about the kinds of things that Paul would have seen that provoked him. But we don't live in Athens, Greece. We live in Fairbanks, Alaska in the year 2024. What are those things that you see? What do you notice? that the city of Fairbanks is given over to. We, we don't have, have uh, numerous idols to see like he did, but do, do you see things? How, how would you fill in that blank that you see the city of Fairbanks is given over to what? Your, your eyes, your ears. We might would have some of us in, in some ways, some different things. Uh, look at Romans chapter 1. Verses 28 to 32, here are things that are just describing the, the Gentiles of the past. And so Paul goes into, uh, he mentions just a, a long list of things that those who did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They're whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Uh, anything in that list jump out at you that you've, you've seen that before, you've noticed that before, and that's something you would say the, the city of Fairbanks has given over to the practice of, of those things. Or maybe things like that. But what he describes is just a, a total disregard for God, and, and he even says that these people have some knowledge of the judgment of God. So again, I don't know what specific time frame or people he might be describing there, but they know something, they know enough, uh, even though they don't know everything, but what they know they set aside, and they just swap that in, and they practice it, and then they take the next step of approving those who practice such things. Well, maybe the way that we, that might be exemplified today uh, the, our city is often given to the idea of, well, just coexist, which doesn't just mean be a good neighbor and others are not going to believe like you. Well, that's reality. We know that. Jesus knew that. But you've heard that. And you've probably seen a, a bumper stickers uh, or something like that where what coexist means is, well, just accept as equally valid all different religious ideas or lack of ideas. They're all equally valid. That. That fits along the ideas of Romans chapter 1. And the idea, well, love is love. Our, some part of our city is wholly given over to that idea. Love is love. Does that include the North American Man-Boy Love Association? Do you know there's really an organization like that? I, I didn't make that up. Is, is love just love? Again, our society has developed some code words acceptance and welcoming are we a welcoming accepting church well i hope so and you who are guests i guess you you can decide that uh, i hope we are but would we put a sign outside oh, we're a welcoming accepting church i wish we could but why can't we well, because our society has transformed that into code for we just accept all beliefs teachings and practices whatever you want to do doesn't matter just do it, and, and, and we'll be happy, and we'll all say that we, we're following God. Can, can you say that? So you, you fill in the blanks and the things that, that you see, but things are really not different because what I've just described would be summarized by some of the things Paul described 
in Romans 1. Also go over to Colossians chapter 2. Because here Paul describes at least some things that would be very different than the, the, the obvious nature of what he described of all the, the murder and the boasting. Uh, those, those things catch the headlines and catch our eyes if we, if we were to witness them. In Colossians 2, though, he, he gives an equally strong warning about things that would be a little bit more subtle in their practice and in their influence. And so you might see them, but you have to give a little more thought to recognize them for what they are. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, he says, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Uh, Paul here doesn't give a list of what those things are. He just describes their general character. And so he says they have a philosophy to them. So somebody can give you a long, maybe even a long, lengthy spiritual explanation for the practice of something. But he says it's just philosophy. It's just ideas that man has come up with to justify doing what he wants to do. And he's got a long line of tradition of people who have done it before him. So that gives it enough legitimacy that a lot of people are going to be given over to doing it. In part because it's been done before. And then in part because it, it sounds okay. But he identifies it as something to be aware of. And something that is not according to Christ. In verse 16, he gives a, another example. Let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths. Here he's describing the, the Jewish holy days, which as a Jew, some of those things they could continue to practice, but no one could bind those practices on all Christians. And so he warns about some who were carrying over portions of the Old Testament and binding them uh, on the practice of those who were following Christ. So beware of that. Then drop down verses 22 and 23. But, but already do you see these, these are a little more subtle than the things of Romans chapter 1. Verses 22 and 23 describes things uh, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Uh, again, what he describes here is far more subtle than uh, uh, jealousies, murder, sexual immorality. You can see these things are more well thought out, uh, more well planned. But he says, but about how he describes them, they are, are equally as dangerous as the other list. And in fact, by what he describes in verses 22 and 23, uh, and even back in verse 16, God could be included in these things. You could even use the name of Jesus Christ in the things that he describes here. Doctrines and commandments of man, at their core might be that, but Jesus' name may be, may be attached to them. And I think you could compare Colossians 2 to Romans chapter 1, and Paul isn't saying, well, these are much, much worse than the other. He's just in a different context and to different people giving the same kind of warnings. Well, again, do, do you see the city of Fairbanks, some portion of our city, or your city wherever you're from, given over to things that would fit the description like these? Let me give a few examples. Last year at the State Fair, uh, saw someone wearing a shirt that said, at the top it said, Bible. The next thing said beer, and then it said bullets. What, what, what's that thinking? What connection would Bible, beer, and bullets have? Well, that's the idea that, well, that Christianity, as it might be called, that this is kind of a good American thing, and good traditional old country boy values is we got a Bible, and we got a beer, and we got our bullets. That, that would fit in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Things that involve the basic principles of the world, the tradition of men, but, but it's deceitful because it, it, starts, it starts with God. And who, who's going to say a bullet is wrong? 
So do you see that? That's a little more, a little more, a little bit harder to pick up on than a city that's fully given over to idolatry. But there is that thinking. There's a common thinking. I've met some people like this again in, in these opportunities like the fair and in golden days yesterday. Well, I need Christ, I'm, and I'm, I'm going to follow Christ, but organized religion, or people use different words for that, but, but the church, well, I, I don't really need that. But in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, when Paul wrote a letter, he wrote it to, to the saints in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. And I realize our society, and, and not just ours, but, but man-made religion in general, has given a bad reputation to what's called organized religion, to what the original word bishop was, is often misused today. So we need to be patient with people who react against organized religion because they've seen how man organizes religion. So we, we need to be patient, but we also need to realize the Holy Spirit uh, guided Paul to write to the saints with the bishops and deacons. They, they were working together. I don't know of any other word, or maybe would be synonyms, but that's not unorganized. If you don't like the word organized, then find another one. But there's bishops and deacons working uh, among the saints. That's, that's God's plan. There's not a pastor working with a board of elders. That's not what we read. There's not a father. There's not a reverend. There's bishops, there's deacons working among the saints. Do you see that? Is our city given over to that or, or your city? Uh, a common slogan you can hear and see is salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That would, would not so much fall into the things mostly of Romans 1, but it would fall into Colossians chapter 2. Because is salvation by grace? It is. I'd really be hard-pressed to justify by grace alone because I could throw in God's mercy, love, but for the sake of argument, we'll assume that's what they mean. Grace represents all that. And is it by Christ alone? Well, technically, the Father and the Holy Spirit are involved, but we'll assume for simplicity's sake that that's included. Okay. But that faith alone part, is salvation by faith alone, well, James in chapter 2, verses 24 and 25 and 26 says it isn't. He says we are not justified by faith alone. So that, that's subtle. Back to Colossians 2, verse 8, or verses 22 and 23. And that, that's a slogan that some religious groups, they, they literally will have posted in the background behind the place where, where they're worshiping. People see that time after time and it, it just soaks into their mind. Salvation is by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Subtle. It has an appearance of wisdom. Colossians 2, verse 22. And then something that commonly goes alongside that is, baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace, or baptism is the next step after you've already been saved. I don't have the time to do a whole lesson on that, but the words of the Savior are, He that believes and is baptized, shall be saved. Mark chapter 16. Does that sound like baptism is the next step after salvation? Or that it's a part of God's plan in offering salvation? But that, those things are, are subtle and often just repeated so much that people kind of absorb them. And it, it, it sounds biblical. And it can have an appearance of wisdom, but it is of no value because it doesn't originate with God. Well, the, these are just some examples I've seen. Uh, what, what would your list look like? The challenge is, the things I've mentioned here, most of them, I've seen them so often they, they don't necessarily easily provoke me in the sense that I've seen it, I know it's there. It, it's easy to, to get used to those things. Not that we accept them, but there are just some things that like idols were so common in that city there's some things that are so common in, in our city that when you see them, maybe you notice it or maybe you don't. You're just so used to seeing it. Or if you see it, you just kind of roll your eyes and, and maybe even chuckle and, uh, and assume that nobody's going to change. And so your attention to it and the implications of it could easily stop there. 
And our spirit isn't stirred up by the reality that these ideas are going to send people to hell for eternity. They're separated from God for now, and that has consequences, but then they're going to die like I'm going to die. And I've got to examine myself, but I have to love my neighbor as myself. When you notice the things that, that came to your mind, do those things, do they, do they bother you? Do they change any of, of your plans? Paul waited, and his spirit was provoked when he saw. And so he, he sat and said a, said a prayer, and then waited for, for Paul and Silas, or for Timothy and Silas. Well, no. He was, his spirit was provoked within him. Therefore, verse 17, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Usually he didn't go into the synagogue without, without some help. You know, Jesus sent them out two by two, and so typically uh, they go when there's help. But they, they were coming, and they weren't yet, but Paul just in his own conscience, I don't think he would have been a sinner if he had, uh, I don't think he would have sinned if he had just waited till Paul and Silas got there, but for Timothy and Silas. But in his conscience, he, he couldn't even wait. Maybe the Sabbath day came, and he, he said, I'll, I'll just, just go at it uh, even now. So he reasoned with the Jews and the Gentile worshipers, uh, probably at, at a synagogue or, or some, he obviously found a place where they all met. That would be an opportunity for him to go to a place at a time where people were meeting, gathering for the purpose of speaking to and listening to others talk about God and the Scriptures, that's something they, they were there for that reason. So it would be easy for Paul to, to sit in on that occasion and either if he was given an opportunity publicly to say something, to do so, or if he was not given that opportunity, then to meet the people there and, and maybe privately to get to ask a question or to offer some verse from the Scriptures that they read, some, read from. Uh, but here were people who were sincere in many ways, spiritually minded in many ways, but they did not know uh, of the salvation that was available in and by and through Jesus Christ apart from the law and the works of Moses. So I, I suppose this was the Sabbath day, but uh, anyway, uh, one time or another, he found them in the synagogue. But then I want you to think about the marketplace uh, uh, that, that this picture is taken of. In, in Greece, they had a place they would call it the Agora or the, the marketplace. And it, it was, maybe back uh, in time, the, the old town square in America. You know, that was where business was conducted and then people would stand around and see each other because maybe they didn't see each other frequently. So that was, it was a social place. It was a business place. It was a news place. Uh, of course, the way that news would get there, there would just have to be a, instead of going to the station, you went to the station. <laughs> instead of going to the channel, you went to the place where news would become uh, no news would be brought, and so that, that's where you went to, to get the headlines. The marketplace was a place where people went for conversation, for business, for news. People went there expecting to talk and expecting to listen. So it, it was just uh, the perfect time and place for Paul to go. Very different from the synagogue, but, but still people were there. And in this case, people gathered there Daily, And so Paul went there daily. And what guarantee of, of results did he have? He didn't know who he would meet there. The wording here in, in Acts 17 is interesting. It was just those who happened to be there. Maybe that carries a shade of God's providence that Paul couldn't go there knowing the kind of people he was, uh, that he was going to meet spiritually minded people. But he just went uh, because his, his conscience compelled him. Uh, we're not told anything about the people that he spoke to there or how they reacted uh, to the things that he said. But we do find, I'm not going to read the rest of the chapter this morning, but because he went there in the marketplace, he was given an opportunity to go somewhere else, a more hope, high-profile part of the city, and to address some of the leaders of the city. 
So even if in outward terms there were no visible results by going to the marketplace, that was a place that opened a door to, to another opportunity and occasion. And then after he had used all the opportunities he had, in verse 34, look at the, the results that came from the time that he spent in the synagogue and in the marketplace every single day for an undefined period of time. What was the great fruit and result? It says some, some men uh, followed him. And then it mentions the name of one man and one woman. So nothing like Acts chapter 2, 3,000 were baptized that day. Nothing like that here. Uh, but the guaranteed result was that he went. And do you think God was any more or less pleased with Paul when some believed as opposed to the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost? Was God far more pleased with Peter because more people were obedient to the faith than he was with Paul? That's out of their hands. Peter and Paul used the opportunity that they had regardless of, of the results. God, God isn't pleased with us based on the results of what happens because the results are out of our hand. And so what was the result of Paul going? He, he pleased God. And that, that's why he went. There are other reasons connected to that, but he went there in order to please the God who he served. So, what do you see? What would you say? This place, your place, the city is given over to. What do you notice? And does it bother you? And if it bothers you, then what? Where, where will you go? Because we, we don't really have a, a daily marketplace like that. Uh, don't think there's a synagogue here. Where are you going to go when you're bothered by the things that you notice? First of all, let me just remind you, start in your home. Maybe the things that you see our city has given over to, maybe you just don't see them in your home. I, I hope not, but they can be there for a variety of reasons. But your home is where, when your spirit is provoked by what you see, it's a reminder seeds are being sown of the wrong kind, and none of us live in, in a closet. Uh, when we go out, and our children go out, and our spouses go out, Seeds are being planted and sown in them. And so in your home, when you see the influence that's happening out there, there's got to be some kind of a counter-influence. And this is a part of that, but God's plan to counter the influence of the world is not mainly, mostly, the saints coming together. Uh, your home is where some other seeds have got to be planted. In Proverbs 1 and verse 8, where children are told, my son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. That's addressed to children, but what does that say about parents? It says, fathers, you better be giving something that your children need to heed. And mothers, there's a law. Do you know the law? Are you teaching the law? Plant those seeds. Start in your home. When, when you see something and you can't do anything about it, you don't have an opportunity to talk to that person. Be bothered by it so that you're motivated by it so that you go home and to the best of your ability you plant some things in your children that will be a barrier between them and that. That you plant some things in your spouse that will be a barrier between them and that. Continue that same effort to people who you know and who know you. Paul went mostly among strangers. But when we see things out there, well then, sometimes we see it in people that we know well and who know us well. And, and that's a unique opportunity. Because already, maybe you haven't said anything, but maybe without a word, you've been able to plant some seeds of, of godliness by your example. That's good. That's a start. But then plant some other seeds. Look for an opportunity to say something. And it can't be everything all at once. But something is better than nothing. When your spirit is provoked by what you see, find people who know you and who you know and be motivated to do and say something. And then last, uh, I want to think a few minutes about strangers. Because here, Paul went to a place, a city he knew no one. He went to a place where he, uh, I think, knew no one and where no one knew him. 
but he went when the opportunity presented itself. He went to strangers who happened to be there. Uh, What can you do when there are strangers who happen to be in the same place that you happen to be? Have you ever had something like that? Even it wasn't planned, an unplanned spiritual conversation with someone. Well, we can't plan for those, but those happen if spiritual things are on our mind. And as we're running the errand, doing the list, checking the boxes day to day that have to be checked, spiritual things are, are in, in our mind. And we're just looking for an unplanned opportunity. Uh, we can all do those in different, different ways. Uh, but the, when we have a gospel meeting, sometimes a, a flyer is a good thing to have, prepared for an unplanned occasion. Uh, the radio cards that we provide at the back, that doesn't really do any teaching, but it gives a website, an email address. It, it gives an opportunity for people to hear some teaching. If you keep those with you, number one, they'll remind you, uh, find someone who might would, would accept it, and sometimes provides an opportunity when there's not even time for a conversation. Sometimes when I can't have a conversation, I can offer an invitation. And what happens when you leave? I don't know. They may dump it in the trash. Or they might read it, and they might think about it, and what will happen next? I don't know. I don't have to. It's just an opportunity. Also, the marketplace in Athens was where people gathered to buy, to sell. They expected to come and to talk and to listen. And I, again, I don't, I don't know of a place in, in Fairbanks or in typical American culture that's exactly like that, except we do have an occasion like that coming up where there's a public place where people come and expect uh, to talk and to be talked to. This is a little bit of a challenge in our society because increasingly we do our buying our, and our selling remotely. And if we do it in person, it's often with a different person every time. And so we, they don't know us. They don't know, we don't know them. And so as our society becomes increasingly private and remote, uh, that, that just removes some of those opportunities. Doesn't mean there's nothing to do. Just means we have to sometimes keep looking. Uh, so sometimes we say, let's try the media. And that, that can be one way to try to uh, show people, to provide for people an opportunity. But that's increasingly difficult. TV, very expensive. Radio is usually very expensive. We we have we found a uh, a radio program that that uh, works for us. But many times those things are difficult. If you search on Google, uh, I wanted to know the Lord. Well, we're not going to come up at the the top of the the search results. and so the media is a place. We have a website and a Facebook page. We, we try to do that, but that's very impersonal. And so it, it's just limited in its effect. But there are some temporary places, uh, like the State Fair coming up. And that, in our culture, that's as close to this marketplace occasion that I can think of. Think about when people go to the fair, the State Fair, especially the, the building that we're in. When people go into that building, what they're expecting is a stranger to talk to them and for them to maybe talk to. And part of the time they're there to buy and to sell, but that's also known to be a place of information gathering. And so it, it's, it's the closest thing that I can think of that is similar to this marketplace where people are there expecting for strangers to say something or offer something conversation or to buy or to sell and so we're trying to go there to the members here there's a a sign up sheet at the back uh, just put out this morning uh, schedule uh, for the time that that you have available for that and then what what else can we do we're doing the things that we know but have your eyes open maybe maybe there's some place maybe there's some opportunity Uh, let's let's not be content with well we We spend 100 hours at the fair, and we have a radio program. I mean, we're doing what we can. Let's do what we can. But maybe we can do something better. Maybe there's some some way that's more effective than what we're doing. Uh, Let's have our minds looking for those things. But what can you do? Because there's some things you can do that we can't do. There's some people that, that you know that don't know us. 
There's some things that fit your personality that don't fit my personality. You have some strengths I don't have, and that's true of all of us. Paul was just using the opportunities that he had. I'm not Paul. You're not Paul. But you, you are you. What can you do? Let's have our eyes and our minds focused on those things because sin will, dis- sin will take us away from thinking about it at all. Satan will do his best to distract us with things that are not necessarily sinful, but they're just that. They're a distraction from love your God first and love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. That, that's as much an evangelism passage as I know of in Scripture. Love God and your neighbor as yourself and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. While Paul was waiting, Paul was provoked, and so he went. What what do you notice? And what provokes you? What stirs your spirit? What, What bothers you? Let it bother you. And do something. I'm... I can't always tell you. I I can't tell you what to do. But do something. We have to look at others if we love our neighbor as ourself. Take out your songbooks and turn to number 294. While we look at others, if we love them as we love ourselves, that also means we, we need to look at ourselves. And we're going to sing this song to urge and encourage you to look at yourself. What what do you see there? What does God see there? If you're here this morning and some of the things that I've said are new and you have a question, uh, please, please ask any question that you have about anything I've said or that you've seen. But if you're here and you know that you're a sinner and you know that Jesus came because you are a sinner, but you've never believed enough that you would be willing to repent of your sins, then you're lost and you're in danger of hell if you wait. If you've repented of your sins, but you have never confessed your faith, the Bible says with the mouth confession is made into salvation, and if you won't confess, you will not be saved. If you've confessed your faith, you really believe it, but you've never been baptized. You're in danger of going to hell if you'll wait. Jesus offers Himself, His promise, and His forgiveness, and His mercy. And if we can help you this morning, if you're not a Christian, If you're ready to confess your faith and to be baptized, we want to help in any way that we can. If as a Christian you need, if you've left left your Savior, He will forgive you and help you. And we are not your intercessor or your mediator. If we can encourage you, we're here for that reason. If we can pray, uh, we offer our time because Jesus offers Himself. If we could help you in these ways, please tell us how. If you live in the light and walk with the Lord, sing this song like you do. Let's together, let's stand and sing.